we celebrate our worship team this morning. <clears throat> Man, I just feel so blessed that we've got such an incredibly talented and selfless team to, to give their gifts and to help lead us. Uh, man, what a gift that we have here in this group. Um, church, this, uh, this morning we're continuing in uh, what has really been an important series for us. Uh, some things that we've learned that have been uh, really eye-opening and incredible. Uh, we've been in this series called Unbelievable. There's this reality that when it comes to the Bible, watch me, look here. When it comes to the Bible, there are things about the Bible that people look at it and they go, that's Unbelievable. There are events that happen. There's animals that talk. There's fish that vomit dudes that back up. Like things that happen and we go, really? Like there are things that are unbelievable. Things that happen in the Bible that people doubt and they look upon with a level of skepticism. And then that skepticism brings a decent amount of criticism, right? So when we say we are Bible-believing Christians, that maybe some of us say we are literal Bible-believing Christians, that brings a level of criticism upon you today. People look at you like there's something wrong with you. You believe all of the stories? But if we, in fact, do believe that the Bible is true and reliable, then we have to own this reality that there are some things in the Bible that seem unbelievable. Because the reality is here. A lot of people struggle with the statement that the Bible is true and reliable. Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you sit there and you're like, Man, I, listen, I'm Sunday school, the whole deal. You know, I'm a lifer. And even I've got some questions. And it's also true that, that for people who have grown up in church, maybe they've been hurt or had a bad relationship or something that occurred, it created a wedge between them and the reliability and the trustworthiness of the Bible. And so the Bible brings about a lot of skepticism, a lot of doubts, a lot of questions in fact, we know that there was a book released just a few years ago called Ready to Return. And in this book, uh, the group that wrote it surveyed a bunch of millennials that were church kids that grew up in church and then became adults, kind of walked away from the church. And they surveyed this group of millennials to find out some of the things like, why did you leave the church? And what are the things that you struggled with? And when asked if they believe the Bible contained an error, 40% said Yes, or they don't know. If they believe the Bible contained an error, 40% said yes, or they don't know. Then they were asked on their own to identify what they thought those errors were, and they weren't given multiple choice answers. It wasn't like, do you think it's A, B, and C? They could respond ever how they wanted to, and then they categorized their answers, and over 50% of the answers had something to do with the book of Genesis. Something to do with the book of Genesis, particularly struggling with the first book of the Bible seems to be a common theme amongst millennials. Now, they were asked specifically about Noah's Ark, and 49% said, that's a legend. 49% said, that's a legend. That's not true. I mean, think about this. What we see is that there are so many people who don't believe in what the Bible has to say, nor do they trust the Bible, that it is perfect and without error. And so we might ask, we might ask, why does that matter so much? Like, what's the, like, what's the big deal? Here's, because it, because if you cannot believe all of God's word, then you cannot believe any of God's word. That's how this works, gang. We don't get to pick and choose what we believe and what we don't believe. The Bible is here. Look, look at me. The Bible is hinged. It is hinged on God's word being true, perfect, and uncorrupted. You tracking with me? Like the Bible has to be all or nothing with regard to truth. And when it comes to the book of Genesis, it not only holds many of the unbelievable accounts that people struggle with, but it also holds the framework that supports Christian doctrine. So with Genesis being such an important book, it's critical that we can trust it and that it's reliable. So if we look upon Genesis and we're like, eh, it's fable, allegory, it's beautiful Hebrew poetry, it doesn't really matter, then we're attacking the bedrock of all Christian doctrine. So Genesis matters, gang. 
It matters. That's why we've been spending two weeks just on Noah's Ark and the flood because it's such a huge event that has impacted history in such a massive way. And it brings about a question, is God's word reliable? I mean, a giant boat, a global flood? Last week, what we did is we spent time talking about the conditions that brought about God's decision to flood the earth. And it was such an important talk because what we, what we leaned into is that God's judgment of sin is real. God's judgment of sin is real, and it's real in light of his holiness. God cannot be in the presence of sin. And so his judgment is real. And we talked about the fact that God mourned the creation of mankind because of the wickedness that was so perverse and so present at that time. We also talked about God's mercy being on display in his selection of Noah in building the ark. Have we ever thought about looking upon a boat as God's mercy in the face of his judgment? But it was. And so if you did not watch part one last week of Noah, I encourage you to go back. I encourage you to go back and watch it. Because today what we're going to do is we're going to tack some of the finer details about the ark, the flood, and the evidences of this catastrophic event. And we're going to do this by discussing three of the biggest questions and criticisms that people have about this account. Now, before I get into this, I'm just going to, I'm going to get real straight with you. <clears throat> this is going to be very academic and highbrow. So for like the type A nerd in the room, you're like, yes, <laughs> yes. You're like, move, I'm coming to the front, man. Like, make room. For those of you that are kind of like, oh, okay, giddy up, right? So we're going we're gonna to need to maybe take some notes and reference back. But what I wanted to do today is I want to hit you with the reality that there is so much. So I might have a stroke today. I'm so excited. Like, there is so much compelling evidence about this event. And the implications of it are so huge that I don't want us to miss it. That's why we had to do two weeks. I need a month, really is what I need. But what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the three, these three big areas. We're going to talk about the ark, we're going to talk about the animals, and we're talking about the flood itself. Okay, you with me? I've already warned you. So if you start to fade and I chuck something at you to get your attention, that's on you. Okay? I got water bottles for days. Now, that being said, we're going to do this from somewhat of a 10,000 foot view, even though it's going to be very academic. Because we just don't have the time to tackle everything. But this will allow us to tackle some of the most common questions. And I believe, I believe this will be really helpful for those of you that are skeptical. Or those of you that are surrounded by skeptical people. And I think for those of you that need answers and just want to feel better equipped so you can have more intelligent conversation with the people around you, this is going to be very beneficial. And I think for some of you who you're already locked in, man, you're like, I can have this conversation. I'm all in on the boat and the flood. I'm good. This is going to be really encouraging to you because sometimes we just need a fresh word to remind us that our faith is reliable and true. Amen? Nothing wrong with that. So here's our first question. How big was the ark? How big was the ark? The first issue that we talked about last week very briefly is that many of us are accustomed to seeing Noah's ark look a little bit like this. Go ahead and throw that up there, John. This, this is Noah's ark for a lot of us. This makes me so mad. Like, I, it makes me so mad. Because this looks like a fairy tale. This looks like something poorly illustrated out of a children's book. And you've got Noah on the side like, oh, Noah, a gopher of a beaver is eaten into the boat. We're going to, like, what is happening in this picture that people are looking at going, eh, isn't that cute? Nothing about this boat looks like it could withstand a year-long catastrophic global flood, right? But these depictions of the ark are... Just part of the problem that we face because by and large, Christians are the one doing this. Christians are the ones doing this. And we're being mocked because of it. Because it looks like we have no idea what we're talking about and that we must believe in fairy tales. And so the, this, I mean, this is everywhere, gang. Everywhere. And not to mention the fact this is just poor taste. Like it's bad art to begin with. But second, it's just poor. Deb, maybe I could enter this into Art on the Square. What do you think? Do I stand a chance, Deb, you think? Maybe a little bit? I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. 
It's poor taste, gang. Look, 750 million to 1.5 billion people died under God's judgment, and this is how we choose to portray that. So we've got to change how we're representing truth and the truth of this event, especially to our children, because it looks like a fairy tale, and there's no need for that. We have the dimensions of the ark. We have biblical proportions to go off of that we can actually get a real biblical portrayal of what this ark is and why it's so significant. So let me help you with that. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. We're going to be camping out in verses 14 through 16 to begin with. Uh, Scripture is not going to be on the screen, so I encourage you to bring your Bible or open a device. You can use the Bible app. You can download that for free in your app store, or you can go to BibleGateway.com and follow along there. But Genesis chapter 6 is where we're going to be. We use the Christian Standard Bible if you're new to redemption. So, Genesis chapter 6. God says, make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it with a pitch inside and outside. Verse 15, this is how you are to make it. The ark will be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. You are to make a roof finishing the sides of the ark to within 18 inches of the roof. And you are to put a door in the side of the ark, make it lower, middle, make it with lower, middle, and upper decks. Now, if you have a different translation, you may not have feet as your unit of measurement. What do you have? Say it louder. Cubit. Cubit, yes. And so what is a cubit? A cubit is an ancient construction unit of measurement. It's an ancient measurement used in ancient construction. And it was used by various cultures, not just in Bible times. And historically, watch here, look at me. It's the distance between the elbow and the tip of the middle finger of an adult man. Here to here. Now, if you're, you know, Sir Stumps a lot like me up here, that's not a very long cubit, okay? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not cubiting very well. But if you're a, a larger, taller man, you may have a much longer cubit. So historically, this unit of measurement was right here. Elbow to tip was the unit of measurement. Now, if you go to the Ark Encounter with us this July, you're going to notice that they build their Ark a little bit larger, it's 510 feet long, 85 feet wide, and 51 feet tall. So why the change? Why the discrepancy? Well, it's because how they measured cubits can be based on the size of the adult male arm. And so there was an ancient cubit measurement that became somewhat of a standard so that large building projects would have consistency. So they kind of agreed on, well, your cubit and your cubit, like we can't keep, if we're going to work and build this thing, then we need a standard measurement that we're going to use. So they developed a long cubit, which was 20.4 inches long, and it's believed that this was the standard of measurement that defined the use of the ark. Now, this measurement was used by various ancient cultures, and we know that in the translation of the Bible, there are discrepancies at times with numbers and spelling of names, but those are the only discrepancies that exist in the entire translation of the Bible over the last 1,500 years. So this isn't uncommon to see numbers be off a little bit. But regardless, what's clear is that the ark was absolutely massive. Let me help give you some perspective here on the size of this boat. It was 1.5 football fields in length. 1.5 football fields in length. Two school buses wide and three full-grown giraffes stacked tall. That's tall. And the top of the bow fin is roughly 10 stories high from the ground. So absolutely massive. And when you think about the ark, when you think about this boat, you need to think of it in terms of a cargo ship because its volume can hold the contents of almost 500 semi-trucks. 500 semi-trucks. And what's absolutely fascinating, here, watch it, you ready for this? What's absolutely fascinating is that modern day engineers have studied on the ark based on its biblical dimensions, and they have found that the ark is the perfect proportion for a cargo ship. It is perfectly sized in order to withstand a, a catastrophic event on the open waters, any longer, wider, or shorter, and the boat would break apart. But modern engineers look upon the boat and its dimensions in the Bible and say, it could stand. 
In fact, in 1993, a group of Korean scientists built a scale model of the ark like you do, and they put it out in the open ocean to see if it was seaworthy and if it would endure the power of the water, and they declared it a success. So how big was the ark? Perfectly big enough. Here's the second question. How did Noah fit all the animals into the ark? I have to wonder if this would be as big of a question if we portrayed the ark realistically. But when we see it like cartoon boat, we struggle with the actual size. But when you realize how big it actually is, it's a little bit easier to grasp. But for the sake of argument, and I'll admit this is still an important question because there's a lot of animals that exist today. Rough estimates say that there's roughly 8 million species of organisms in the world. Okay, that includes land animals, marine life, insects, etc. So how do we get to this place of 8 million organisms and Noah being able to handle everything on his boat? Well, Genesis 6, 19 through 21. Genesis 6, 19 through 21 says, You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Verse 20, two of everything from the birds according to their kinds, from the livestock according to their kinds, and from the animals that crawl on the ground according to their what? Kinds will come to you so that you can keep them alive. Verse 21, take with you every kind of food that is eaten, gather it as food for you and food for them. So, if Noah was to bring at least two of every kind on the boat, of every organism, it'd be 14 to 16 million creatures, right? Based on today's standards. Well, here's the thing. Let's examine this. God said first to bring all land-dwelling, air-breathing animals onto the boat, two of each kind. There's no mention of sea creatures here. That's the first one we get. I remember one time I, I was teaching this very idea to a group of middle schoolers. And so I was like, all right, what questions do you have in our small group time? What, the kid said, what about dolphins? How did he get dolphins on the boat? I said, it wasn't necessary. He said, yeah, but God said put everything on the boat. I said, no, no, it was fine. The dolphins were fine outside of the boat. He like couldn't. It was very upsetting to him that God was trying to drown a dolphin. I'm like, you can't. Relax. I'm going to flip this table, bro. You know, like the dolphins are fine. So when you eliminate marine life, the number drops drastically. And then you think about insects. Well, they don't fit the category listed, but some scholars believe that insects could have been on the ark, but they wouldn't have taken up much room at all. Matter of fact, insects breathe through holes in their body, not like other animals with lungs. So it's a little different. But it, let's just assume for the sake of argument, they were on the boat. Second, we know that the animals that came to the ark were juveniles. This makes sense because the goal after the flood is what? Reproduction. We got to repopulate things. So having juvenile male and female animals means a lot of reproduction and a lot of population. Okay? And so as we continue to examine the animals on the boat, we see that God told Noah to bring, here we go. This is important. Watch me. Look here. Kinds of animal. Everyone say kinds. That's a really important word. He says to bring kinds. We see that several times. So what do kinds of animals mean? Well, when we talk about modern taxonomy, which is the classification of all living things, the word kinds fits into the area of family. It fits into the area of family. This is because most animals, most animals, somebody remember, anybody, are we going back to biology class? Are we heading back to integrated science? Anybody with me so far? You've seen this before, right? Like I struggled in public school, and if you've not seen this, we're all in trouble. You know what I mean? So this is the classification of animals, okay? We learned this in science. Kinds fits into the notion of families because most animals within a family, watch, can mate with each other and produce offspring even if they're a different genus or species. You with me so far? We see this in dogs, they are part of the Canadia family. All members of this family can mate and produce offspring. It's the same that's true for, the family, for lots of families of animals. Cats can do this. Horses can do this. So on and so on. So if we stick to our example of dogs, there are roughly three to 400 breeds of dogs today. Three to 400 breeds of dogs. On the count of three, yell out your favorite breed of dog. You can't say mutt. That's cheating. Okay, so give me your favorite breed on the count of three. One, two, three. 
you're right. Labs are the greatest. I totally agree. So, Noah did not bring 400 breeds of dogs on the boat. Noah took two dogs. And from two dogs came lots of reproduction, lots of multiplication. And all the dogs that we have today, whether wolf, fox, wild, or domestic, they are all dogs. They're all dogs. And they're all the same kind. Now, someone might say, how is it possible that we have all the change in only a few thousand years? Two dogs, bro, and we got all of this today? Because, to be fair, there are a lot of dogs today. Matter of fact, my neighborhood Facebook page lights up every nine minutes with lost dog. There's a lost dog. It's on the corner of Wabak. There's a lost dog. Like, it, people freak out. There's dogs everywhere. What we have to realize, watch what we have to realize is there are only 35 species of dogs in the world today. 35 species of dogs. All domestic dogs and the wolf are in the same species. And to make this even more tangible, let's talk about dog breeds. All the dog breeds we have today, all of them, came about in the last 500 years. All of them, all your favorites. In the last 500, the last 500 years, we have the Great Dane and the Yorkshire Terrier. Same species through the process of artificial selection. Yeah? Artificial selection. We've chosen what genes and what genetic composition we want and what we don't want. Let me show you something really, really cool. Check this out. So, the Great Dane, the Yorkshire and the wolf are the same species, same species. Yet the wolf and the coyote look very similar, don't they? Very similar, yet they're completely different species. The difference between wolf and Great Dane came through artificial selection. Same species took a very long time and a lot of research and a lot of science and a lot of selection. The differences between the wolf and the coyote are very minimal. I mean, they're almost hard to tell apart at a distance. They're so minimal. But it took place in the wild over the course of a few thousand years. So it's super easy to see how from two dogs, we can get lots and lots and lots of dogs and various species. The differences between the wolf and the coyote took a couple of thousand years to take place in the wild. That's how slow of a process is. That's how clear of a process it is. So we, we see how genetic diversity can exist. And this brings us back to how many kinds of animals were on the boat. All right, this, this is legit. This one even got me. A team of experts, biologists, archaeologists, geologists, and geneticists with Answers in Genesis as an organization worked on compiling an answer to this question. It was a massive undertaking. They published lots of papers, wrote books on it with lots of surprising evidence, working with the active fossil record, extinct and living animal records, and they concluded after a ton, a ton of research, here it is. Put this up there, John. 546 kinds of mammals, 284 kinds of birds, 320 kinds of reptiles, 248 kinds of amphibians for a total of 1,398 kinds, roughly 6,744 animals on the boat. Now, that doesn't seem like so crazy, does it? Some of you are thinking it'd be easier to deal with almost 7,000 animals than take your children on vacation. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'll take the 7,000 animals <laughs> all day. And some of them are trying to eat you. So not millions of animals, but based on what we know to be true about families of animals and reproduction, 6,700 animals over the course of a few thousand years could absolutely, absolutely bring the population of what we see today with regard to the 8 million animal population. Not that hard to see at all. The data is wildly supportive. Now, while all this is fascinating, still the number one question about the animals on the ark is, anybody want to take a guess? thought I heard it. What's the number one question people get about animals on the ark? Somebody say dinosaur. Who said dinosaurs? Dinosaurs. 
Were there dinosaurs on the ark? That's our time. Hey, listen, thanks for coming today. Man, that'd be so good. I'd be so mad. The answer is yes. The answer is yes, and I'll tell you why. What's important to understand is that a lot of animals that used to exist no longer exist. Can we all agree? Okay, a lot of animals that used to exist no longer exist. Animals have gone extinct for a long time over multiple centuries due to climate, food shortage, and hunting. So dinosaurs on the ark are not a problem. Them becoming extinct after the ark as a result of global climate change entering in an ice age is not a problem whatsoever. The problem is we've watched way too many uh, scenes and way too many times we've looked at Jurassic Park. This is the problem. We've been conditioned to believe that dinosaurs were either massive or really tiny. And you always knew the small ones were the terrifying ones, right? If it's the size of a chicken, it'll rip your throat out. That's kind of what we thought. When in reality, here you go, you ready for this? When in reality, the average size of a dinosaur was that of a large cow. That's the average size of a dinosaur. Noah was not to bring adult, massive dinosaurs on the ark. He would have brought juveniles onto the ark. And there would have been estimated at that time anywhere from 60 to 80 dinosaur kinds, which means less than 200 on the ark, which makes them the minority. There were more mammals and birds than dinosaurs. Everybody's like, what about the dinosaurs? Far more mammals and birds. So dinosaurs on the ark are not the problem. Additionally, we have dinosaur-like creatures in the Bible. This is why I tell you, read your Bible. In the book of Job, we have mention of two. We have the behemoth with the description of his size, how massive his tail is and his movement being slow, swinging his tail like a cedar tree. Then we also have mention of the Leviathan, which is not a dinosaur, but it's a massive sea creature that can come onto land that you could not hook or fight or it will kill you. Dinosaurs are in the Bible. So dinosaurs on the ark, not a problem. And we'll talk a bit more about that here in a little bit. So on to our last question. Is there evidence of a global flood? Now you would expect, you would expect, you would expect that if there was a global flood, there would be evidence of that today. Yes? yes. Amen? Yes. Christians, we do not have a blind faith. We have a reasoned faith. God has given us reason and logic, and we can use in our faith because of all the evidences we have. I love how Ken Ham puts this. He says, what we do find all over the earth are billions of dead things buried in rock laters laid down by water evidencing Noah's flood. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water. That's what we find all over the earth. So what are a few major evidences of a global flood? Number one are rock layers and canyons. Let me show you this time scale for just example. This is a geologic time scale. We get taught this in school. Okay, this is integrated science here. Uh, so the lower you go in the soil, the older it gets. And the higher you go in the soil, the what? younger it gets, okay? This is what we know. But is this true? Is this true? Can rocks, watch me, can rocks, layers, and canyons form very quickly under the right conditions? Under the right conditions. For a long time, we were taught, no, it cannot. But all of that changed on May 18th, 1980 when Mount St. Helen erupted. I wanna show you a cool video. It's just a few minutes long, but I wanna show you something that might just blow your mind this morning. All right, go ahead and take a look at this. On May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens, located 95 miles south of Seattle, Washington, erupted. The eruption was triggered by an earthquake centered beneath the mountain that measured 5.1 on the Richter scale. The lateral blast swept out the north side of Mount St. Helens at 300 miles per hour, with temperatures as high as 660 degrees Fahrenheit and the power of 24 megatons of thermal energy, it snapped 100-year-old trees like toothpicks and stripped them of their bark. 
Before the famous eruption at Mount St. Helens, scientists were mostly familiar with slow-acting examples of geologic change. But at Mount St. Helens, geologists watched the Earth's surface change quite rapidly. Icebergs were buried in hot avalanche material. They melted and formed badlands in days. Eruptions on May 18 and June 10 produced fine layers in hours. On June 10, mud flows cut zigzag canyons 100 feet deep in soft sand and mud, complete with perpendicular side canyons, canyons that are reminiscent of the geography of Grand Canyon, only 40 times smaller and clearly produced within hours. Mud flows over the following decade cut hundreds of feet into solid rock in just days of cutting time. Fallen trees formed a log mat on the surface of Spirit Lake and dropped bark to the bottom of the lake, accumulating up to three feet of bark peat in just a couple years. And vertically floating logs sinking to the bottom of the lake resulted in buried trees in only a decade similar to the trees of Yellowstone's fossil forest, which are also buried in volcanic layers. Even though Mount St. Helens is a very small catastrophe compared to the flood, or the major catastrophes immediately following the flood, it provides a better clue to what happened in those times than the slow geologic processes which are most commonly seen in the present. So the explosion of Mount St. Helens not only drastically changed the landscape of the Washington area in just a matter of months, it also dug holes, deep holes, into the idea of millions of years. It dug deep holes into the idea of millions of years. That millions of years are needed for rock layer, canyon, and fossil formation. Mount St. Helens did it in a month what they believe took millions of years to happen other places. Mount St. Helen clearly testifies that these things do not require long ages to form. And so a global flood brings about incredible power and incredible force that would have buried things very quickly. This is why today we are seeing dinosaur fossils with soft tissue being found. Right here. This is from a Tyrannosaurus rex. That's soft tissue, gang. Mary Schweitzer, who's a scientist, she's a paleontologist, she's a professor at North Carolina State University, studied this T-Rex fossil, discovered and examined blood vessels and soft tissue. And in an interview, in an interview, she publicly said, it's not possible. She said, tissue in blood cells cannot last 65 million years. So she ordered a repeat of the testing done by her department multiple times only to have it come back conclusive that it was in fact soft tissue DNA in a Tyrannosaurus Rex bone. And she says that's not possible and there's no other explanation for how it could have been preserved for 65 million years. The proper examination and explanation is that this dinosaur was killed and buried quickly, deeply, and well-preserved for thousands of years, which is why you find soft tissue in its bones today. There's another really incredible find of a triceratop horn that when they dug into a DNA study of it, found actual thriving bone, like, uh, bone fragments inside the horn that defy 65 million years of preservation. It's absolutely fascinating. And this is consistent with what we see in Scripture, gang. Look here. It's what we see consistent in the Bible. Billions of dead things buried in rock layers laid down by water all over the earth. And from its size to its contents to the effect of the flood, this event, this boat, it's far from a legend, and it's far from being a fairy tale. Amen? Amen? Noah and the ark and the flood are not stories, but they are accounts, accounts of history that have made a huge impact. And what is so fascinating to me 
is that beyond all the research, okay, I've hit you with a bunch of research and I gave you just like entry level stuff today. You come with us to the uh, creation vacation and it will blow your mind. It will blow your mind, the data. We'll set all the data aside for just a minute. We'll set all the science aside and all the evidences aside for just a minute. What do you do with this passage? Matthew 24. Now concerning the day and the hour, no one knows. This is Jesus talking. Neither the angels of heaven nor the son, except the father alone. As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the son of man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way the coming of the Son of Man will be. Take all the evidences aside. What are you going to do with the fact that even Jesus believed in a global flood? Even Jesus believed in the ark. What are you going to do with that? Jesus, while teaching about his promised return, references Noah and the flood. Now, if Noah and the flood were fable or allegory, why reference it when making a promise or prophecy? Why would you do that? Why give people a reason to doubt? Jesus didn't do that. In fact, Jesus only ever fulfilled every statement he ever made about himself, the foundational claim being that he would die and be raised from the dead by his own power. So now Jesus is talking about his return, which must mean that Jesus believed the story of Noah and the flood and that it was important enough to illustrate his return with, that it was obviously important. Jesus wants us to know something really important about the ark, and it goes far beyond science, and it goes far beyond the evidences. You ready? This is it, gang. I'm going to share this with you as the band comes because this is where we're going to close today. This is what Jesus wants you to know about the ark. That he is like the door on the boat. That Jesus is the door on the boat. Here's what I mean. Listen, don't miss this this morning. Jesus delivers us from judgment, just like the ark did for Noah. Noah. Originally, Noah and his family survived because of the ark's protection. While a wooden ark delivered Noah from physical death, a wooden cross delivers us from spiritual death. And just as Noah obeyed God by climbing onto a boat to save a few, Jesus obeyed his father by climbing onto a cross to save many. Just as Noah and his family passed through the door of the ark to be saved. We must enter into Jesus to be saved. Make no mistake this morning, church. Just as Noah and his family entered through the door, we must enter through the door. You want to know how I know that's true? Because in John chapter 10, this is what Jesus says. Jesus says, I am the gate. And in fact, some of your translations may, something, uh, may say something a little bit different may say, I am the door. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I said this last week and I mean this. Don't miss the forest for the trees. The science and the data are wildly compelling and they draw us to a younger earth understanding or a global flood or an ark or, or wherever you land in your understanding. But if you land with a deep belief that Noah's ark was built and a great flood happened, but you miss, you miss this, you've missed the whole thing. We are living in the days of Noah, church. Now it is categorically worse than that it is now. I know you think things are bad. But we are living in the days of Noah. And so the question then becomes, are you in Christ today? Are you in Christ today? Or are you doomed 
to drown? Are you in Christ today? Have you placed your trust in him? Are you sitting securely in your salvation? Have you walked in through the gate? Are you walking in obedience to Jesus? Some of you said, yeah, I've, I've walked into the door, but man, I, I sure like to sneak out when he's not looking. And I sure like to engage in behavior and deceptions that I shouldn't be involved with. Man, are you, are you enjoying obedience to Jesus or are you hiding sin, thinking you're not gonna get caught with the door closed and you on the outside? Are you enjoying the sweet relationship with Jesus? <laughs> Man, are you growing in your faith? Are you spectating or are you participating? So let me ask you this, redemption. What's your next step? What's your next step today? There are a couple of next steps that I think the gospel demands from us. As a church, we've got a 4G discipleship pathway that we use. where We want you to learn what it means to glorify, to gather, to grow, and to go. And so we want to give you next steps that help put you on that discipleship pathway that create points of entry for you because we want to see you mature in your faith. We want to see you come to faith. We want to see you become all that Christ has saved you to be, man. That's what we want for you so desperately. So we got a few things for you today. So maybe today's an opportunity to glorify God by placing your trust in Christ and walking through the door. Maybe today's the day where you walk and find salvation and come through the door. Maybe today you step into obedience by getting baptized and surrender your life to Christ. Maybe this is an area of of disobedience you've had for a long time and you've not made that decision to step into baptism. Maybe today's a day where you repent of sin and you're done fighting. You're done fighting. There's no shame here. There's no guilt here. No one here can sin shame you. We've all fallen short of the glory of God and we all deserve death and hell forever. So if today, if you want to repent of sin and recommit your life, then, then come on. Maybe today's a day to grow by deciding, you know what? I really enjoy digging into scripture today. I really enjoy digging into this. And maybe I need to join a community group where I can find connection and growth with other people. Or maybe today you say, you know what? I'm new to redemption. And I really feel like this might be my home and I wanna know more about redemption. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna commit to going to starting point. I'm gonna take a step today. What step do you need to take today? What step do you need to take? So I'm gonna pray over us, gang. And I'm gonna invite you that if you need to walk through the door today, if you need prayer today, if you need to surrender your life, if you need to have a, a gospel conversation today, just come on, man. Just come on down and come down to the front. And let's talk. Talk to myself. Talk to Rodney, one of our other elders. Just come have a conversation with us because we're all in this together. But I'm going to tell you, life outside the boat is not where you want to be when the rain comes because it's coming. But life inside the boat ain't no sweeter life than that. So let's walk through the door together. I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to pray for you, pray for movement. So Lord, help us, help us to hear today this message. Help us to hear what you would have for us as a result of it. God, all of us in here represent so many different places and stages and struggles. And the reality is, Lord, the story of, of Noah and the flood, that's not fable. That's not legend. That's not a cute kid's fairy tale. That's truth. It's true that you hate sin, that you will judge it. But it's also true, Lord, that you're the God of mercy and of grace. So help us today, Lord, if we're not inside the boat to, to make that decision to come forward today, to walk inside the boat, 
to, to walk through the door, to affirm you, Christ, as our Lord and Savior, to place our trust in you, to surrender to you, to take a step of decision. Maybe we're in the boat today, but we're just not growing in our faith. And let us take a step of growth today. Help us, Lord, know how best to respond as we seek you for the next few moments. Jesus, move, Holy Spirit, move, and let us do whatever we need to do to be obedient to you today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Let's stand together, gang. If you need anything, we'll be right down there.